Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone in person. It's the first event I've attended for two and a half years, I think, and uh, still getting used to it, having arrived uh, last night. And I don't know how many people are joining online, but uh, welcome. Um, I have two papers that I'm going to talk uh, talk about today. I, unfortunately, my co-authors couldn't be here, so I'm, uh, uh, while not being intimately involved with these papers, I'm, I, I have an overview, so I'm going to try and frame these papers for you. Um, they're both about analyzing language, the language of the design process, and how we can go about um, doing that in quite uh, detailed Ways. And actually, they're both papers that are, are works in progress, and it, to some degree, didn't succeed in what we wanted uh, what we wanted them to do. But I think it's interesting to sort of show these these kind of workings out of of, um, of how we think about what happens in a design process in order to try and kind of learn from our failures in some in some respects, but also kind of build better understandings of of. Um, design process, and particularly the talk uh, and linguistics that designers use. Um, so the first paper, these are my co-authors, Amila, Amila Akhtar Salah, who's uh, now at uh, Utrecht University, and Central Chair Jester Guerra, uh, and myself, um, together with part of the uh, Designing Intelligence Lab at the, uh, the TU Delft Faculty of design, uh, Industrial Design Engineering. So the first paper is going to be about uh, the idea of storytelling in design, which is something I've been um, researching and thinking about for, for many years. And uh, the second paper is um, similar, but looking at aspects of tentativeness and causation in, in the design process. So I think just to start with an, um, an overview, um, I think we've got to the point in design thinking research where we, we understand the, some of the concepts of designing quite well. Uh, we've got some good language to talk about uh, what happens in design process theories of design. Um, but actually, I think one thing that we haven't done so much is try to validate these concepts by looking at actual design processes and specifically the way that designers talk um, and interact. Uh, and that was part of the motivation for doing these, these two studies, was trying to take some concepts um, that people have, uh, have used to describe design and actually sort of say, well, how do we recognize these sort of processes of design? Um, and the data that we used uh, to, to do this was the DTRS data sets. For those of you that don't know the history of the DTRS, we have four shared data set uh, symposiums where various people collected data um, on designers designing. And, and these together produced a really nice corpus of um, activity. But we thought this was a good, a good starting point. I'll come on to the, to the details of the data a bit later. Um, and also moving into more computational analyses of bigger data, basically. When we started out these series of conferences back in the 1990s, we had to send around video uh, VHS uh, tapes, uh, there wasn't much video of design activity taking place now that now you just have to surf on the web. There's huge amounts of data of designers designing. I think, I think that's one challenge for us is to, to think how we can process this data and understand more about the activity of designing. Um, this paper is, is using a method called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, LOOC for short. Um, I'll come on to more details about that. The next paper is using a, a, a tool called Empath uh, and machine learning techniques. Um, and uh, as I said, this paper is about the idea of storytelling in design and so I think one of the messages is kind of learning from failure, not being able to show what we wanted to show. Um, so in terms of some of the some of the established concepts of of design activity, I mean, uh, Newton just gave a, a, a talk about what design activity is, not but I think some of these things are, are fairly kind of well established in our, in our discipline now, the idea of framing from Sean, uh, design fixation has been well researched, uh, originated from Janssen Smith, become evolution, Nigel Cross and Case Dorst is now a concept that's, that's familiar. I've, I've looked at the idea of storytelling, and Bo and Lyndon both here, um, 
to the idea of epistemic uncertainty. And these are just a few of the concepts that I think are, are fairly well established. But when we look at actual design activity, is it possible to identify this and point, point to the areas where these things are happening? We talk about framing. I think that's actually very difficult to do. So we're going to try and speak for saying there's clearly framing activity going on, uh, on here because it has these certain characteristics. And what we wanted to do with this, uh, with these uh, two papers was to try and uh, get into more detail about what these things actually are. Is it possible to identify computationally these patterns in conversation? So I went back to my um, paper that I gave in Copenhagen, actually, at the last PGRS 12, and found this quote, again, that I really liked, which is about storytelling. Um, and about uh, particularly Jerome Bruner, who is a psychologist at Harvard University, uh, very interested in the notion of storytelling and what it actually does uh, in normal life. Fortnite's narrative of storytelling is fundamental processes through which we engage with culture, providing recipes for structuring experience, their roots to critical thinking, often juxtaposing you unusual ideas, values, or outcomes that generate novel insights and questions. And I think that's the uh, that's why I think storytelling is such a powerful idea in, in um, thinking about design processes. Is that they bring all these, um, all these aspects of our experience, uh, our experience. They allow us to tell stories about the past, the future, uh, talk about our values in, in very concrete ways. And my paper at the DPR 12 tried to do that in terms of the, in terms of the data that was part of DPR 12. Um, so just to give you a bit more detail about the DTRS uh, data sets, we, we basically combined them all into one big corpus. We, we, we went back, um, looked at all the transcripts that we had, transcribed the, uh, um, made new transcriptions, um, got all the data into a, a certain, into a, a good format, cleaned all the data, um, and put it all into one big place so we could begin to analyze it as a as a as a as a corpus. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so for those of you that don't know the DGS uh, uh, data set, DGS two was a think about protocol study. Uh, DGS seven was looking at professional um, design activity in architecture and engineering. DGS ten was looking at um, design education and learning. Uh, DCRS 11 is looking at co-creation in uh, professional con uh, uh, contexts. And they all have, they're all reasonably big um, data sets. You can sort of see the, the size in terms of uh, word, word numbers, DCRS 11 being the, uh, the longest, and the number of sessions. So DCRS 10 had a, a lot of sessions. It looked at a lot of different educational scenarios and uh, um, educational disciplines. Um, and you can see that the final corpus size was around 370,000 words, which is actually pretty small for a, cor um, a corpus. But what our reasoning was that these, these four aspects of design and professional activity, think about design, education, and co-creation, give a good overview of the different types of activities that happen in the design process. So they were a good data set to, to use and to kind of explore, basically. So uh, there are too many data sets that you can look at and sort of say there's definitely design activity happening here, but, but our assumption was that with this data set that we could make that assumption. Um, what, we, what we used for this uh, paper, paper was something called linguistic inquiry and word count, Luke, which is something that's been developed over the last 25 years, I think. Uh, basically, it's a, a, a dictionary um, of psychologically oriented terms, but also normal linguistic terms, uh, which you can uh, throw a text at, and it basically highlights the words which, uh, which fit into certain categories. And these are some example categories. Um, so obviously a lot of the words are what's called function words, which are the kind of structure of language. So, so, so you can see that um, obviously a lot of language has this, these kind of structural aspects, pronouns, prepositions, articles, negations, all those kind of what's called function words. Um, then we have other, other grammatical constructs and grammar, common verbs, adjectives, interrogatives, those kind of st the structures of language. And 
Then we have um, the psychological processes. So what we have is affective processes, social processes, cognitive processes, perceptual processes. And what the loop dictionary does is allocate the words in a text to one, of, one or more of these categories. And it's important that these are overlapping categories. So words can be more than, more than one category and often lots of different categories. But basically, you're counting words in, uh, in a text and then using those, the, the word counts to, um, to explore certain, certain concepts in language. So um, the use of pronouns, for example, um, is, is, is quite well established. Uh, um, it's not an obvious thing to look at because we use pronouns all the time, but the use, use of pronouns can tell you a lot about uh, you know, the power structure in a, in a, in a conversation um, or a text, um, the way that people um, think of themselves. Uh, for example. So we use this as a basic uh, tool. Um, and just to give you an example of what the DTRS corpus looks like when you, when you put this loop analysis uh, through it, um, what I've, done, what I've got, got here is um, this is the DTRS corpus and this is a, a written corpus of written data. The key, the key feature of the DTRS corpus is it's conversational. Luke is really designed for um, written, written text. Um, but what I think, um, when you compare the two da databases, and this is a sort of technique we, we've been using, is to compare different types of data with design, design data to try and work out what the differences are. And I think what you can see in this, this thing is, that is the, the kind of intermixing of the relative and the cognitive process categories relative to it is time, time, motion, space, cognitive processes, is insight, discovery, those kinds of those kinds of words. So words associated with those concepts and there's a kind of intermixing there as compared to the written corpus where the where the categories are sort of slightly distant from each other. Um, also lots of lots of verbs used used in design making, uh, thinking about the future, thinking about what people are going to be doing. Um, and also affects this category here is also quite interesting that we'll come on to, to talk about a bit more. Um, so that was a general analysis of use. How do you use Luke to uh, analyze stories in design? And obviously storytelling has a big, uh, has a long history. Um, I think Aristotle was the first one that you know, said a story has a beginning, a middle and an end. But uh, right up to the present day, people have been trying to think about what makes a story, what's the structure of the story, um, what are the distinctive features of the story. And we, came, we, we looked at three papers in detail in terms of methodology. Um, one is uh, called um, Degree of Narrativity. This was a very interestingly titled paper called um, What Happens in Vegas Stays on TripAdvisor, where um, basically people write when they, when they visit a place, they tell a story about a place, and this was a, a big data analysis of the kind of stories that people tell, um, and TripAdvisor is a very good place to look at how people tell stories. Um, then um, Regan, 2016, looked at the, the emotional arcs of stories, and Boyd et al., 2020, uh, looked at the narrative markers for stories, and we really, we really based our analysis on, on um, Boyd um, in 2020. Uh, and so we did two different types of analysis on the DTRS data and the arc, arc of narrative, which basically we, we segment stories into five lengths. So there's a big um, segmenting the protocol, uh, working out which, which turns in talk are, represent stories. There's quite a lot of pre-processing that, that goes on. But basically we were trying to identify utterances within the, the DTRS data that that um, were more than 100 words and use those utterances, break them down into five sections and look at the different phases of, of story. So the arc of narrative analysis starts with staging, uh, plot progression and cognitive, te cognitive tension. These are the three aspects of, of, of stories that change over the course of the story. Um, the emotional toning of stories uh, looks at the positive affect, uh, words that are positive, and then the negative affect, words that are um, negative, upset, disappointed being the examples there. So these were the two analyses that we did of the DTRS data set. Um, and just to, just to show you what a typical um, arc, arc of a narrative looks like with the, um, 
the, the, the Boyd approach, the staging, plot progression, cognitive tension. This is uh, staging here, so you tend to find um, use of prepositions and articles at the beginning of the story here. You have to set up the story, the man in the house, in the, uh, with, with the car, with the whatever. Um, uh, so you, the staging decreases through the story. Um, the plot progression um, increases, so what happens in the story. Um, and then the cognitive tension, which is um, the, the sort of thinking processes, so people discovering, people wondering, people uh, uh, feeling afraid, those, those kinds of things, those increased cognitive tension, those three elements in a story change uh, throughout the five segments. So you can sort of see one, two, three, four, five segments. So these are the points that we count um, where a story. So we basically try to identify where these happen in the DTRS data. Um, and if you, this is just an example from um, DTRS 11, a quote, um, uh, and how we coded it for the different words related to staging, plot progression, and cognitive tension. Uh, and you can sort of see that there's a lot of plot progression there. Um, there's some staging characteristics and there's some cognitive tension. So this is likely to be coded as the middle of the the middle of the story. Um, uh, and what we also did was compared our analysis of stories within the DTRS data to three other data sets, basically trying to work out whether the methodology that we were using could reveal stories in in other data sets that were more like stories. Um, we had three different, uh, three different data sets that we compared our analysis with. One was um, uh, stories, stories of five sentences produced by Mechanical Turk, um, which are very um, uh, simple stories. I'll give an example of each one. So this was the, um, uh, a, sim a simple story from uh, Me Mechanical Turk. Jennifer has a big exam tomorrow. She got so stressed, she pulled an all-lighter. She went into class the next day, weary as can be. A teacher st stated that test is postponed for next week. Jenna felt bittersweet about it. That's a typical story that, that comes from um, these five-sentence database. And I think there were 50,000 of those. So, they, so our assumption was that these would be fairly easy to ana uh, analyze um, with, this, with this method. Um, the Internet Movie Database also has, has um, uh, data in the form of movie scripts 1,070 movie scripts uh, that we could look at in terms of stories. Uh, and this is an example. Um, and these tend to be kind of, be, again, they're written down. It's written dialogue rather than dialogue dialogue. So it tends to be very kind of neat dialogue and, and feature certain themes. And then we have the uh, national public radio and US public radio phone-ins, 10,000 hours of people phoning in and, and talking about stuff, basically. Um, but telling largely telling stories. So we figured if we could, if our method would, could, could pull story shapes out of these more, more story-like data, then it should be able to pull stories out of the DTRS data. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, what we did was, was uh, try and identify utterances where, where we thought stories would be occurring. And we made some assumptions um, which was single utterances over 100 words. Uh, and there aren't too many of those in the data set. Conversation is, is, is often quite rapid. Stories are kind of broken up over um, um, differences in turns. I mean, these are, the, these are the kind of realities of dealing with this conversational data is that stories are very fragmented. Um, but we wanted to see if we could uh, identify from single utterances over 100 words and there were 267 of those um, after we kind of filtered, filtered out for other, other things. 267 complete stories. Uh, otherwise, we had kind of story snippets that we, that we looked at, fragments of stories. Um, but that's one of the problems of this approach is, is identifying what, how to break the data down, how to, how to work out where a story is, is happening. So we, we go through a process of normalization too. This, this describes the normalization that process that we go through. We calculate the mean, then we cal calculate the standard deviation from the mean for each segment. 
uh, each of the five segments for each of the categories, so staging, plot progression, and cognitive tension. Uh, and these, these were the results. I mean, you can get more details about the, the, the results. Just on the, on the left there, I put the kind, of, the kind of shape of the story that we were expecting, or the, the, the shape of the story that um, Boyd found in their analysis. Uh, and you can see that there isn't really, we don't really see the same shapes. We see some of the, some of the shapes, with, this is the, uh, the five sentence stories here, we can sort of see some staging decreasing. And in the DTRS data set you can see staging decreasing. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, the, the plot progression, um, normally you would see that slowly rising through the, the five stages. Um, and it sort of does with the NPR over here. Uh, and a cognitive tension too, you would sort of like to see a kind of that increasing. Uh, I think what, what's a little bit misleading about these, these um, graphs is also that if you look at the axes, we're in a much smaller zone here than we are for, say, the N NPR data set or the ROC data set. So the, the differences are very, are very, very small. Um, but I think... Um, so we didn't, I, I mean, basically we couldn't work out from, but by looking at these graphs, whether we were identifying uh, uh, stories or not. So um, I think we, we still have to kind of develop the, the, the methods to try and work out whether this approach is going, is going to work in the long term. But there was enough there to, to make us think, yeah, we're sort of getting some idea of what stories are and where they might feature and, and, and how to go about analyzing them. We also looked at the emotional arc of, of the stories in the, um, in the various data, partly to see whether stories have happy endings or sad endings or how emotionally toned the, the language of designing is uh, across, the different, um, ac across, across the different data sets. Um, there wasn't, again, if you look at the, if you look at the axes, there's, there's very small variation uh, in the DTRS compared to something like NPR where you expect radio phone-ins to, ha to have a lot of emotion, uh, emotion involved. Um, and also the uh, IMDB, there's a, a, a fairly big scales there, so you expect a lot of emotion to be involved there. Um, but basically, if you're, if you're ending higher than you started, you're basically having a, a happy ending or a, a sad ending. Um, but again, I think that was... Uh, inconclusive for the DTRS uh, data that we looked at. Um, let's see what I'm doing for time. How much time have I got left? Got 16 minutes. 16 minutes left, okay. Uh, so just a quick interim conclusion then, I, and I'll, I'll try and conclude after the, after the next paper, um, that we found it very difficult to validate this concept of storytelling. Storytelling is something that you try and convince people happens in design, in design process, but how do we actually show that? And I think we still need to develop the methodologies in order to do that. Um, one of the things that maybe it's a broader discussion is that, you know, I've called it the primacy of talk, but for, I, I find talk is a very good way to look at designing, and particularly design thinking behavior. If we're, if we're going to expand design outside of the design discipline and look at design thinking practices, then we need to talk is a much, be much better way of looking at it than sort of dealing with artifacts and sketching and, and, and drawing. Um, and I think because of, the, because of the, the currents of bigger and bigger data sets, we, we need to develop these approaches where we can, get more con we can more consistently say, yes, there's designing happening here because, it, because there are these features in language. And actually, Luke is a really powerful way of looking at language. There are lots of different analyses using Luke in different, different dis disciplines. So it's a very good way of comparing, um, to comparing what we do to, to what people do in other, in other fields. And actually, Luke has just released a new version, uh, which has a kind of narrative analysis built into it. We, used, we, we had to construct ours, but it now has a narrative analysis built into it. So I, I'll, I'll just end there. And I'm just going to whiz through the next paper, because it's, uh, it sort of builds on this. Um, uh, 
Um, and using Luke before, that's a predefined dictionary. It's a predefined set of categories. Um, there are certain words that relate to certain categories. They've been developed over a long period of time under discussion. Um, it's a very well. It's, it's almost a standard way of looking at um, uh, linguistic analysis of conversation. But actually, the question is: Do those categories fit um, design thinking research data? Uh, so our other paper, this paper, was about developing our own categories. How do we develop our own categories for looking at um, design thinking research data? Um, so. Uh, this is pretty much the same basis. We use the same data set. We're studying transcripts. Uh, we use the DTRS um, data set um, as before. And we already carried out our, our, our loop analysis. Um, so this was asking the question, can we define custom categories? Can we identify custom categories within uh, large textual data sets. Um, so what we, what we use is a tool what, called Empath, uh, which uses a, um, a machine learning approach to um, basically constructing categories. You give it seed words that you think relate to a certain category and, and Luke, uh, uh, sorry, Empath um, constructs the other words that relate to that category, so you can construct a, a construct a category that you think might exist in a in a in a data set. Um, and this is um, this is how it does it. This is uh, sent to my co-author's uh, description. Probably a bit too detailed for me, but basically, um, uh, Empath is based on a, a training data set of, of of fiction, so it already has. Um, a basic category structure that's, that's, uh, that's validated by humans. Um, and basically it tries to predict word co-occurrence. So if you, if, you, if you want to look at a certain word or certain category, it looks for the words that relate to that category that co-occur um, frequently enough for it to be part of that, uh, that category. So you basically input uh, you, uh, a category and then you list a number of seed words and basically it tells you all the words that relate to that category, so you're constructing that category within, um, within the text. So here's the very simple example of the category of pets. You give it the seed word dog, cat, leash, uh, and it gives you a list of words that relate to, relate to that through the cosine similarity uh, of words that relate, relate to pets, but also words that don't relate to pets. So we're kind of building a, a, a certain understanding. Um, and basically, we looked at constructing two categories, again, that are kind of based on um, ideas in the design thinking research uh, literature. One was the idea of tentativeness, the idea that um, design is about projection, being un unsure about the future, what, what could happen, what might happen, um, suggestion, proposing, things like that, things, things, things like that, that occur fairly regularly in the design process uh, when you're not sure. Um, so a couple of, couple of references here. One was Friedrich Gloch in 2009 sort of saying, you, you know, it's a softening of language. It's a, you know, a could, a might, a probably a suggestion. And then there's Bowen uh, Linden's work on epistemic uncertainty too, you know, hedges, down toners, possibly might, I don't know, I'm not sure, kind of, all those sorts of words that occur quite regularly in, um, in design activity. That was one of the, the first category that we tried to construct. Uh, and these were the seed words that we gave uh, empath. So you, there is a bit of playing around with empath, putting in different seed words, seeing which, 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 which words come back. Um, but these were the, this was the output from empath. So these are all the words that it thinks are in the category of tentativeness. And you can sort of see that there are some, some odd words there. Uh, I can't see them now, but sometimes it, it returns words that you sort of think, how is that in that category? But then, but then you have to realize that it's trained on a fiction data set and fiction has certain characteristics, which again is, is um, something you have to take into account. The second category that we 
tried to uh, construct was uh, what Senthil called causation, the sort of rationality of design, but sort of really the, the other side of projection, explanation, you know, explaining why something is happening, re the reasoning processes uh, in design. Uh, the, the rationale behind decisions, explaining why things, how things operate, how, how things function. Uh, and also, yeah, critical, critical question answering, causal antecedents, causal consequence, rationale. So the, the other side of, of projection is explanation. Uh, these were the seed words that we used for this, uh, for this category. And these were the, um, the output from empath. And there are a few words there. I think you can see um, illness, I think, came out one. Killing came out with another one, and again, that's fiction. That's it's fiction. So you have to sort of think what's it, what happens in fiction that, that uh, gives these outputs from empath. But we didn't we didn't filter these words. We just used we constructed this category and then uh, then applied them to the DTRS data. Uh, so we had these two uh, categories, and basically what we did was in the DTRS data count the sentence count the utterances where one word from each from one or the other categories occurred. So, of the entire of DTRS eleven, for example, one hundred percent of the um, the utterances, around fifty percent had one or more words related to tentativeness, and around twenty two percent of words related to causation, related to explanation. So you could make you might conclude that design activity uh, seems to be more about tentativeness than it is about explanation. Um, but also, um, what happens is that a lot of utterances have both tentativeness and explanation in them, and actually that is a much more, a much better um, representation of a, of a data set. So here um, you can see that around yeah, 20 twenty percent are both have utterances that are both tentative and uh, relate to causation but still we have about 30% that are only tentativeness, so you can still draw the conclusion that uh, design discourse is largely tentative. Um, we can apply that to the different um, DTRS data sets because we're looking at the whole corpus, uh, and you can sort of see the slight differences between the, the four sets of DTRS data. Uh, and again, it's quite consistent that we have this category of tentativeness uh, in all in all four, slightly more in DTRS 11, slightly less in DTRS 07, but similar sort of patterns. Uh, and then we can actually um, look at specific cases where there's high overlap between uh, the tentativeness and causation, which happened in, um, I think, DTRS, is that seven in DTRS 10? And then cases of, of lower overlap, so in theory, um, cases where there was more discourse around causation, although there still wasn't that much uh, discourse around causation. Um, so we can drill down into the data at this point. So we've constructed the category, we've run our analysis, and then I think we've, we've kind of evolved this method of actually, you really have to go and look at specific cases to see what what the what what's actually being coded automatically within this this text and try and make sense of 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 small cases so this is a case from DTRS 7 of an architect talking with a, a council officer um, who, and the architect appears to be being more tentative with, uh, tentative with his uh, with his talk um, these are the words that, that, that overlap between the two categories so might might and yet are both yeah, in, in both the tentativeness and the causation category. Uh, and then we have one word that relates to causation only. So you could uh, sort of conclude from this that the architect was being, with, with both, both trying to suggest and to explain to the, to the client, uh, the, the council officer. Um, drill down into a case with lower overlap. This is from DTRS 2, Thanks, Paul. Um, which is three designers working on a bicycle, an aftermarket bicycle pannier, I think. Um, and they had very short turns in their conversation. Uh, and you can sort of see here that um, there's more causation 
uh, words here that are highlighted than, um, than tentativeness. But actually, uh, oops, but actually what, 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 what's missed in these categories are, I think somewhere is kind of, so kind of doesn't relate to tentativeness, that didn't show up in the tentative, tentativeness category. Um, and you could, you could say that's a very obvious way where people sort of say it's kind of this or it's kind of that. That's a way of, of sort of hedging or downtoning some sort of certainty. So there are words that you expect to be in the analysis that, that aren't in the analysis. Uh, and then we can also look at um, behavioral patterns. This is from DTRS 10. This is a design education uh, example of where Don, I think, is the tutor. Emily is the uh, Emily is the student, and you can see that the tutor is uh, being more tentative in his in in his uh, suggestions. Um, and our our conclusion here was that although it only highlights a very few words, that the high incidence of tentativeness. Instructors behaving more as a, a consultant than a than a teacher. He's not explaining. There's not a lot of explaining going on. It's much more kind of suggesting to the students. So we can begin to reveal um, kinds of um, educational com uh, conversations that take place. I think too. Uh, and so what what I think we can do with this approach is we can obviously do a kind of broad, broad global analysis of the text, but we can also zoom into very specific examples and look to see what kinds of um, patterns of discourse are happening, what words are being used, and what those words kind of represent. Um, so overall, for this, our, our work with Empath, these were our kind of our findings. So uh, there are high incidences of tentativeness and causation in sessions where participants have more opportunities to challenge, question, and justify choices. So in DTRS 7 and DTRS 10, DTRS 7 being the, the designer and the client um, having a discussion, and DTRS 10 being uh, educator and student having discussions. Um, more tentativeness was found in collaborative exchanges, so in DTRS 2 and DTRS, uh, DTRS 11. Uh, and also, I think what we've learned through basically these two papers is that to do a global analysis, you need to do a close analysis too. I think a lot of the work that we've seen, certainly that I've done, and a lot of the work in DTR7 has been very specific. If you, if you look at the kind of methods that people use, they're very looking at very specific examples of conversation and trying to argue that certain things are taking place. But what that lacks is a kind of more global overview of, of the data. And I think this way of um, analyzing language um, begins to get to that kind of more global level, but we can't lose sight of the, the specific example. So you need to kind of keep a balance between those two things. Um, and I think one of the, one of the kind of, uh, one of our longer term aims is really to kind of broaden out um, these analysis by looking at other types of data to try and identify the kind of dictionaries and words associated with design activity. So that's kind of a broader term aim, is that we'll be able to take a, take a text of, let's say, uh, some politicians talking about the future, and then throw that at our dictionary and say, yeah, they're using these concepts, they're using these design thinking concepts, they're talking about storytelling, framing, uh, tentativeness, these are, the, these are the markers of a design conversation. That's where we aim to get to, and these are just the first tentative steps to get there, I think. Thank you very much.